the Perverted Dicks. Yeah! yeah. Or Poison 13. Yeah! And maybe she heard, might have heard of ZZ Tom. Because they get played on the radio quite a bit, yeah. But they're, there's no dirt about ZZ Tom, no. Yeah, right. Nope, there's gotta be. They can't no. go 65. <laughs> I did see him the other day, though. Billy Gibbons. Probably, guys, there's no magazine that this woman would have walked out of. She's from some other place. Like, this guy who looks like he's 90 years old, and you could just push him over like that, is with... Anyway, yeah. So, okay. One guy that we uh, feel like we should talk about... Um, and that, that won't be Henry Rollins. No, I don't know. <laughs> There's someone that who's kind of a, um, he's, he's the guiding spirit of this book, and that's a man named Brendan Mullen. Yeah. Brendan um, is responsible. Um, we could pretty much, if anybody ever made it up to L.A. back in the, back in the good old days, yeah, um, we had a clubhouse called The Mask, which basically, if you went into it, it would resemble like a really sleazy, scuzzy bomb shelter. Like, go ahead and fucking fire your missiles at us. We're gonna be down here listening to the eyes and the, the bags and X and the weirdos. Um, the, the clubhouse was our ground zero. And Brendan was the guy that was responsible. I um, was asked to play a couple of shows with Black Flag when Ron Reyes quit, and I loved the band, uh, and I said, of course, I volunteered to play at the Fleetwood in Redondo Beach and then play up at the, the fabulous Mabui Hay Gardens up in San Francisco. And the show that we were playing up in San Francisco with, was with a guy named Gaza X and his band, The Mommy Men. And Brendan was playing drums. And Brendan sat in the van with them all the way up to San Francisco and couldn't wait to jump out of the, out of the van. He was just like, you know, I love playing in this band, but I just, I'm not feeling the vibe that these guys are tossing off. Um, so we unloaded our equipment, and we were just going to go drive around, maybe find something to eat, look for a parking place. And Brendan said he wanted to come along. He didn't really know us. He'd heard about us. Greg Ginn and I had bothered him to the point where he had their bouncer at the mask toss me physically up the stairs. And... We started, we're sitting in the back of the van, we start conversing, and all of a sudden, Brendan volunteers the fact that Black Flag is his favorite band from Los Angeles. And I'm scratching my head, it's like, dude, you had X, and the Weirdos, and the Dickies, and the Screamers, just this whole long list of amazing bands, and you just select Black Flag? And he was like, you guys aren't like anybody else. It's like, you don't look like any of the other bands. Um, you know, it took a while for him to warm up to us uh, because of the conversation. He and I actually started to become really good buddies. He started booking other venues and we would play the other venues. Um, that, would go, that went on even many years after. Oh know, yeah, he, he was booking a club called the Club Lingerie on Sunset Boulevard, and he one night he would have screaming, uh, screaming Jay Hawkins, and the next night he would have the Flaming Lips, and then the next night he would have uh, Etta James, and just like every night was just something mind-bogglingly great. That's how good he was at his job. 
And yeah, um, there's there's some good juicy stories about the circle jerks playing club lingerie in the book. I, I won't get to them. Uh, if you do decide to purchase the book, you can, you can read about it for yourselves. Brendan and I become really great bros. Yeah, bro down. Bro down. Bro mania. Uh huh. Like backyard parties, barbecues. Summertime soirees, all sorts of fun shit. How you doing? What's going on? I run into him. I, I hadn't seen him probably for about two and a half, maybe three years. Because this happens. People in bands get in vans and they drive away and don't show up for another year and a half, two years. So I run into him at a, uh, an art gallery down in West Los Angeles in Culver City. And... Uh, we checked everything out, scooped everything out. Now it's time to socialize out on the sidewalk out in front of the space. And he and I were just like going at it, just like a couple of cartoon characters. Heckle and Jekyll. A couple of blackbirds going at each other, or what have you. Tom and Jerry. Um, he asked me how I'm doing. I'm doing great. He says, so... Um, what do you got going on? Uh, I'm not really, I'm just kind of goofing around right now. He said, do you have enough stories to write a book? You need to write a book. That's the reason why this book is here. Blame it on Brendan Mullen. You, you can blame, you can blame the... Second wave of punk rock in Los Angeles on Brendan Mullen. You know, because the first wave was the seeds and the scandals. Yeah. Yeah. They were garage rock bands, that's what they would be called. Riot on Sunset Strip, just many of the riots on Sunset Strip and Hollywood Boulevard. Um, he said, Keith, give me a call. I'm gonna I'm gonna help you get a book deal. You know, you got to write a story and it's got to be something that pleases the people at the publishing company. You know, it's got to have some kind of a spin and some kind of a twist. It's like, well, why can't I just tell stories? It's a book, you know, a book's full of stories. And there's got to be, there's got to be an arch or an arc or whatever you want to call it. Uh, point A to point B and everything in between. You didn't know what I was. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> Brendan said, give me a call. And I call him and he said, I'm, I'm uh, going on my uh, anniversary with my gal pal. And I'll, I'll be back on Monday. Give me a call on Monday, Monday afternoon. Uh, that Friday, he fell out of his chair up in Santa Barbara with a massive stroke. They, they pulled the life support. Uh, that Monday morning, and I was like, I, I was, I was wiped out. Uh, my first thought, which is really fuck and very self-centered and very egotistical, and really messed up on so many different levels, was there goes my book. Brendan was going to help me get a book deal and write my book. At that time, he was in his third rewrite of a Red Hot Chili Peppers book. And Brendan has written and, and, and is responsible for some fucking amazing books. Uh, Jane's Addiction. He wrote a uh, co-wrote a book with a guy named Mark Spitz called um, We've Got the Neutron Bomb. And... The germs, too. Yeah, he did the one with Darby on the cover. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's Brendan. That's the brilliant Brendan. And so here I am being an asshole. Not even fucking thinking about the loss of my friend, but the loss of my book. How fucked up is that? That's just fucking lame. Like, really incredibly lame. And um, maybe an hour later, it, it dawned on me I had a my epiphany that, you know, I just lost one of my best friends. And that's way more fucking important than any book. So, uh, how about a uh, raise your glass for Brendan Ball? Yeah. And Darby Crash and Jeffrey yeah. Pierce. Yeah. And Lux and Tyrion. Yeah. 
Joseph Bader Schmidt. Joe Strummer. Joe Strummer paid me um, one of, well, besides Chuck Berry, Joe Strummer came up to me when I was bartending, ordered um, how many drinks did the folks drinking around? He was in L.A. with the Pogues, because it was that period where he was a member of the Pogues. And he looked at me and he said, Keith? I mean, he said, Keith? I'm like, okay, wow, this is... <laughs> he could say, you're the biggest fuck face I ever met, but he said, I love your body of work. Wow. Holy shit. That... And Chuck Berry playing Roll Over Beethoven with the Circle Jerks could be some of my highlights. So we got a few minutes. Uh, you want to take a few questions from, uh, from this? Really? Not really, no. <laughs> Let's get questions. Because this guy's going to ask, so what's Henry Rollins doing right now? <laughs> Why do you dislike Henry Rollins? I, mean, I could have, I, I could have really, I could have really shoveled a lot of shit about fucking Henry Rollins, but I do respect him on a certain level. That get in the van book, that's a pretty goddamn motherfucking happening book. So, Henry Rollins. High road, high road. <laughs> so what would you like to ask, sir? I did not know that you played with Chuck Berry. How did that come about at all, that you played Oliver Beethoven with Chuck Berry? We were on a disastrous tour, and that was the highlight of the tour. Um, we, had just, we, we had just put out Oddities, Abnormalities, and Curiosities, which is a record that should have never been made. That was, well, how much money are you giving us? <laughs> During that scenario, our A&R guy, who was getting uh, the grind by the other people at the record label, wants to know, well, you gave me three songs. Uh, I need to hear the other songs. You, no, you don't. You don't get to listen to the songs that we're writing. In fact, we're going to fucking lock the door to the rehearsal space. Don't even bother to show up and knock on the door. Just give us our money. That's pretty much what that scenario was. I, I, I cannot back that record on any fucking level. <laughs> Except if you get to work with the guy that worked with Neil Young. And what, about, <laughs> and what about the Debbie Gibson? Well, that was a good, that was, you know, that was fun. It's like all goofy and, you know, um, bubble gum. Um, no. No, um, no, that that would be Debbie Gibson maybe when she was 13 or 14, but we worked with her when she was, didn't she do a spread in Playboy or Penthouse or one of those magazines? Our producer, a guy named Nico Bolas, who was David Briggs' engineer. David Briggs did all of these, Neil, all these great Neil Young records, but he also, David Briggs, produced all of the great Nick Cave Bad Seeds yeah. records. Yeah. And I want to work with the engineer because the engineer worked on a Neil Young record where they recorded six songs and the record label said, what the fuck, why are you right. giving us this? Yeah. We can't do anything with this. The way they recorded it is Neil Young has a, uh, a ranch, boathouse, piece of property with a small lake on it. Neil Young came up with the brilliant idea. I'm going to paddle out into the middle of the lake and and we're going to run a guitar cord all the way out to the middle of the lake and I'm going to stand in the boat and I'm going to fucking rock out. And Nico, the guy that produced our record, was the guy that was recording all of this back in the boathouse. I said, I'm going to work with a guy that can do that kind of a thing. That sounds like a lot of cool thing. Well, at that time, yeah. yeah. Chuck Berry, 
from getting back to your question, because I talk in circles. That's the reason why Jim wrote the book. I told the story. He wrote the circle, I straightened them out. We're on tour. We're promoting this fucking horrible album, the record label, which is a major record label. I got to meet a couple of the guys from Def Leppard at the record company. And that was probably another highlight about that. But um, um, we're on tour. Nothing's going right. Um, we're, we're doing okay uh, with the crowds. The crowds are decent enough to make it look like you know people are showing up. So we played this place in St. Louis that's on the Mississippi River called, of all names, Mississippi Nights. Okay, what do you do in your nights when you live in St. Louis and there's nothing going on? Well, let's go to Mississippi Nights. So we're playing, and all of a sudden, we look down at the front of the stage, and there's Chuck Berry. And... He's doing this while we're flying. Like, could one of you guys like bend down over here and let me ask you a question? And we're so excited and do, doing our performance and all jacked up and whatever that we don't take the time to acknowledge him. Our 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 uh, road manager happens to kneel down at the front of the stage and apparently the request was I would like to play with these guys yes. now when a, when a guy of that stature because we're, we're, we're in this room no matter what we listen to when it comes to anything loud and voluminous and rocking he had something to do with it if you're a guitar player, somewhere you're playing stuff you play. There'd be no Keith Richards, there'd be no Angus Young, there'd be no Johnny Thunders, there'd be no Steve Jones. This guy pretty much, if you're a guitar player, you're reading stuff out of that book. Um, so, Greg has a rig that's set up to where he can split it. There's two heads, two cabinets, plug them in. They've got an extra SG guitar. Chuck Berry probably played a few SGs in his time. So he starts playing. It's like he doesn't even tell us. This is, this is how he works. He shows up in a town, and whoever shows up to play with him plays with him. There's like not a group of guys standing around in a rehearsal space going, yeah, we're opening or we're playing with Chuck Berry tonight, so we got to learn all of these songs, and so we're gonna play with Chuck Berry, and it's like it doesn't work that way. It just it's really a fucking crazy scenario. Um, he starts playing, and Greg turns around and looks at everybody and goes, just follow along. When he gets to the chorus, you're, no, you're going to know the song. <laughs> I'm standing there in the rocks. Like, I, I can't even sing. I'm just fucking paralyzed because uh, there was a point in time when I had a, uh, I think it was maybe the sixth album I ever owned. It was a double album. It was Chuck Berry's Golden Decade. And that side three never left the turntable for like three months. It, he's... Just there, there's nobody else like him. Maybe Jimi Hendrix, maybe Duke Ellington, or you know John Coltrane, somebody like that. But they're just these untouchable people, and he's one of them. He's jamming. I'm like, but the band's playing along, and he's rocking. And he's doing his duck walk, and fucking the, the, all of the punk rock kids. You would think, well. That guy, he's rock and roll. We don't, no, that's kind of like the Rolling Stones or whoever. And we don't, no, it doesn't sound like GBH. Fuck yeah. You guys suck. And the kids, it was far from, the kids were just, he, it was fucking ape shit. I mean, bodies flying everywhere. They were, the kids were losing it. Maybe they, the, the kids that live in St. Louis had heard rumors about him, you know, maybe seen something on TV or whatever. 
Maybe they heard the rumor about him filming women in the bathroom. Ah, yeah. That's a good one. You know what? They can excuse him for doing that. Come on. No, at least he wasn't dealing child porn or fucking, you know, cooking up speed to sell all the, the school kids. What do you know, Keith? We're almost out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> right when it gets into, All of a sudden. Right when it starts to get juicy. <laughs> so, uh, right when I was going to talk about getting laid by a biker chick. <laughs> That's not in the book. And, no, that's another story. That's for the next book. Uh, all right. So we'll have to get, uh, you'll have to file these copies so we can write a sequel. It's been our pleasure to share my damage with you. Hey, thank you. And you know what? You know, you know, you, you, you stay right where you're at because the dude that's coming up here is a serious fucking guy. Or when you were going up to record it. Well, look, we were going into the studio, and um, as we're loading our equipment up the stairs, the plimsolls are coming down the stairs, and that's how we met the plimsolls. Recorded the nervous breakdown. No, Black Flag recorded nervous breakdown. The plimsolls recorded zero hours. Yeah. Yeah, let's not confuse everybody. Yeah. 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 Hey, thanks. Stick around. We love you. It's worth it.